Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of our K-12 Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series. Uh, today's session is Flipped Learning for Administrators and will be presented by John Bergman. Uh, my name is Riley McClure. I'm a, one of our product marketing managers here at Blackboard focusing on our uh, K-12 teaching and learning solutions. Uh, joining me today and uh, helping to moderate questions and, and track our uh, attendance for follow-up is uh, uh, Jenny Breister, uh, another member of our K-12 marketing team, and Katie Gallagher, uh, who is the director of our K-12 uh, teaching and learning solutions marketing team. Uh, as always, uh, you know, we are always open to new ideas for topics and, uh, you know, open to new presenters for our series. So uh, if you ever uh, think of a topic that you're, you'd be interested in hearing more about or uh, would like to put your name in the hat uh, as a, an interested presenter, uh, please feel free to reach out to any one of us, and uh, we're happy to, to have that conversation and, and see how we can help you out. And as a reminder, all of our uh, K-12 Innovative Teaching Series sessions are recorded, and we do upload those to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can see the URL here on the screen. I uh, would highly recommend you uh, taking some time to check that out. We, we always have great content there for you. And uh, new for our, our K-12 uh, Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series, uh, this fall we've launched a new professional learning community to uh, support our uh, K-12 Innovative Teaching Series. Um, here you can find all of the uh, information on upcoming sessions. Uh, you can find recordings of our sessions as well as uh, session presentations and materials. Um, from time to time we're also working on uh, you know, providing some interactive discussion and, and other uh, instructional and blended learning resources uh, to help you. So uh, we, we definitely encourage any of you who are interested in um, new models of learning and, and new models of, of teaching to uh, to join and uh, uh, join in the discussion there. And we look forward to seeing you. And then uh, finally, uh, before we get started here, just wanted to remind everybody we have a, a couple great sessions coming up. Um, we do run our sessions on Mondays and Fridays. Uh, upcoming uh, this Friday, we'll have our uh, K-12 Lunch and Learn. Um, Jason Don Forsyth, uh, who is one of our Blackboard product experts, will be presenting on the Moodle Rooms Personalized Learning Designer. Uh, and then, uh, you know, next we will be taking the following Monday off, but uh, next Friday, Jeff Page, another product expert, will be uh, discussing adaptive release and curriculum design. And then finally, uh, uh, Monday, October 19th, uh, we have another great session. Um, we have a couple of our, our, uh, our colleagues from uh, Macomb ISD uh, will be presented on uh, be presenting uh, their blended learning strategy, and uh, looking forward to that session. So as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're really excited about today's session. Uh, we're very pleased to have John Bergman joining us. John is a pioneer of the Flip Classroom movement, and he's also the chief learning officer of FlipClass.com. Uh, he has uh, co-written the books Flip Your Classroom, Reach Every Student in Every Class Every Day, Flipped Learning, Gateway to Student Engagement, and Flipped Learning for Science Instruction. Throughout John's 24 years as a high school science teacher, he guided his teaching with one overriding concern. What is the best use of face-to-face -face class time? As a result of John's innovation and tenacity, he received the Presidential Award for Excellence for Math and Science Teaching in 2002 and was named the semifinalist for Colorado Teacher of the Year in 2010. He co-founded the Flipped Learning Network, uh, flippedlearning.org, a nonprofit organization which provides teachers with resources needed to implement flipped learning. John also serves on the advisory board of uh, TED Education, as well as hosting The Flip Side, a radio show that tells the stories of flipped educators available on the BAM radio network. Uh, today, John's joining us and uh, going to discuss how administrators can implement flipped learning into their schools. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand it over to John and uh, thanks, John, for, for joining us today. Oops. You're welcome. I think I've lost the ability to to move the slides. I got kicked out just a little bit ago. So okay. if you could re-give me the ball or whatever it is I need to have, that would be great. There, there you go. go. Should have it now. Perfect. So, hey, it's been great, uh, great being here. I'm working here, and I'm in uh, um, Ulster County, New York. 
doing a workshop with uh, teachers today. We had a great session. Aaron Sams is here with me. Um, he's working with some teachers a little bit longer here today. And uh, just it's exciting to just see how Flipped is growing, um, frankly, around the world. I just got back um, from a two-week trip to um, Korea and Taiwan, or Korea and China. Taiwan was last one. And um, just to see how this is taking off and just really working, how Flipped is not only increasing test scores, which is obviously something a lot of people are interested in, but really just reconnecting teachers with students and really um, increasing the engagement of learning. And so it's just really been exciting to see this just continuing to grow. And uh, so I've got some re recommendations as, um, as Aaron and I have really been working with a lot of schools around the world, helping them kind of uh, bring flips to their classrooms. And as uh, we've observed a lot of things about schools. One thing about schools that's intriguing to me is that schools are very much the same and also very different at the same time. So regardless of where you go, teachers are interested in helping their kids. And some of the same problems teachers have in Korea are the same problems that happen here in the United States and in Iceland and in Norway and all these places that I've really had the privilege of visiting. So can you flip a school? You bet you can. So let's talk about how you flip a school. I'll start by just asking how many of you are parents. My guess, if you're an administrator, that most of you are parents. And um, I want to ask, as a parent, have you ever had this experience? Have you ever sat with your son or your daughter, and they've been at this point where they're really frustrated, and they're struggling with their home? Work and you're struggling, you're trying to help them, and it's just sort of this impasse. Um, I have three kids. My oldest is out of college. I've got one in college, and my youngest is a senior in high school. And with all my kids, I have been at this place where this young man is in this picture where they've been frustrated with their homework, and they've wanted to give up. And my wife and I have been trying to help our kids, and they've been, you know, it's just it's, it's, it's just that moment where we all there. And I would bet, I'll bet some of you were there last night, weren't you, right, uh, <laughs> trying to help your kids. I believe we've got a problem. And I believe the problem is that we are sending our kids home with the hard stuff. We are, we have school backwards in many ways, and we need to rethink what school looks like. And so when I talk about stuff, let me, um, let me give you some data before I dive into that. I think um, most of you are probably familiar with the work of Robert Marzano. And Robert Marzano uh, keynoted a conference that I spoke at last year, and we both were keynoting. It was in Washington, D.C. And when Dr. Marzano got up there, um, and he described something that he'd done, he'd done a big sort of research study of classrooms. And uh, using one of his in instruments, maybe some of you did this, it was uh, for um, evaluations and uh, whatnot. He was in two million classrooms, which is a lot of classrooms. And what he found in those two million classrooms, is, or the question he asked in these, in these classrooms, is what instructional practices are actually being used in K-12 classrooms in the United States? And this is what he found. He found out that 58% of all class time is used for interacting with new content and essentially stood on the stage and said, that means lecture. Now remember, this is K-12 data. This includes kindergarten classes. 36% of the class time is practicing and deepening that new content, um, which means kids doing worksheets and, and doing practice. And only 6 only 6%, that's right, 6% was the cognitively complex tasks. Folks, I think we got a problem. I mean, we, we've been talking about the sage on the stage as opposed to the guy on the side since the 90s. But it hasn't changed. We still have teachers standing up and just yakking at their kids. And so I believe we've got a problem. And um, I think we need to rethink what school looks like. So when I talk about we sending the kids home with the hard stuff, what I really think is, let me define this. When I say the hard stuff, um, I want to use Bloom's taxonomy. So you guys remember Bloom's, right? Bloom's taxonomy. If you had been in my classroom before I flipped, remember, so my background, I was a high school science teacher, also taught middle school. But if you had been in my, my classroom those first 19 years, I spent the vast majority of my class time doing remembering and understanding stuff with my kids. I was teaching them, you know, how to balance a chemical equation. I was teaching them Newton's laws. I was teaching them the slope-intercept form. I was teaching them stuff. And what did I do? I then sent my kids home to apply, analyze, evaluate, and create. Now the problem with that is they go home and they have a moment like that young man we saw the picture of and they want to give up because they can't do it. They don't have the expertise at home to get the help that they need. 
Now, maybe they do. Maybe they're lucky. Like my daughter, Em, who's a senior in high school, she came to me a couple of weeks ago and said, Dad, can you help me on my physics? And I said, sure. But her dad was a high school physics teacher, right? And I taught AP chemistry and physics and math. And so I helped her, right? But most of her friends don't have a high school physics teacher dad to come home to get help from. And I know many of you probably work in schools where, you know, kids go home and, you know, their parents are working two jobs just to make ends meet. They got single parents. And, and the parents really want to help. They're good people, but they just don't have the time, energy, or even necessarily the, the knowledge to be able to help their kids. And for some of you, that's just you. Maybe you've got a high school kid and they're teaching physics and you, know, you were an English teacher. Now you're an administrator. So you don't remember your physics. You can't help them. Um, you know, or, you know, whatever. I think we've got school backwards. We are sending our kids home with the hard stuff. And so I think what we ought to do is flip Bloom's taxonomy. So what if we spend less class time, I'm talking about class time now, on remembering and understanding activities and more class time here at the top of Bloom's doing the application, the creation. We want to spend more class time here. So think of the area of the, of the shape I love my diagrams. Um, <laughs> the area of the shape as class time. We need to spend more class time in the more difficult cognitive tasks. And I especially think in light of sort of the new reality of education in America, right, with common core state standards, or let's call it the new standards, because I know Virginia is with you know, different standards in Texas or whatever. With, with the different standards, if you really analyze, and I'm sure many of you really have, analyze the, the new standards that we have in the United States, um, it's higher order cognitive tasks. But most of our class time is on lower order cognitive tasks. And so I see a huge disconnect in terms of the way we're teaching. We need to rethink, if you will, Bloom's taxonomy. And as Aaron and I have thought about this even more deeply, we believe that we need to think of Bloom's in a slightly different way. We think the actual correct shape, for lack of a better term, of Bloom's taxonomy is actually this diamond shape, where you spend the bulk of your class time in application and analysis and less time at the top and the bottom of blooms. Now, why do I say that? I mean, don't you like John, don't you like kids doing a lot more creating? I do, but I just don't think it's realistic in K-12 education. I believe in creation up here, you just don't have that kind of time, even you know, given the reality of standards and all that kind of stuff. Um, if we go back a picture, you know what this is called when you have blooms upside down? I believe that's um, called a PhD. Right? That's called great for PhD education, but I think in K-12 education, the more realistic picture is this. And as a note, Aaron and I seem to write a white paper about this topic, and they go into a, a forthcoming book we're soon to write on um, rethinking homework. Um, so you guys are getting some kind of new stuff on some of our thinking. So the bulk of class time should be spent doing application analysis. Now, hear me carefully when I say this. I am not saying that you don't do remembering and understanding in class. I think when you do less of it. Because also, I know you can't apply and analyze something you don't know anything about. So I'm not against lower level content. I know there's a need for foundational content. I'm just going to argue that that lower level content doesn't have to happen to the whole group as the teacher teaches in the traditional sort of lecture mode. I think we need to rethink what school looks like. And so that's sort of a backdrop to flip. I haven't really talked about as it applies to administrators, but I wanted to give you that sort of cognitive framework so you can understand how flip is and isn't working. So um, why don't I pause? I'd like to kind of hear some questions from you guys. And so there's a chat. If you, I don't know if you can see the chat. Some of you are interested. Derek, you just chatted. But what kind of questions do you have? Let's take a pause before I kind of go on with my presentation. What are some of your questions? And I'll just sort of respond to a few of them. So if you could type a question in the chat, I will respond. Or not? Should, should, guys, should I actually be looking in the chat? Is that the correct place to see the questions, or am I in the wrong spot? You're in the right spot. I, I think we just have a, a shy group. So, uh, you know, if you do have a, okay. a, a, some questions, <laughs> here we go. Right. I'm glad to go on. There we go. Yeah, actually, John, that's a great question. Or, no, you're asking John. I'm John. You spelled my name wrong, so I thought you were John. So, Derek, um, this is an issue. What if the kids don't have tech? Oh, my. Actually, that's sort of two questions I always ask. That's the first one. What if they don't have tech? You know, when we started this, you know, we were a couple of high school science teachers in Colorado. 30% um, of our kids had no internet at home. So we had to solve this problem. So number one, some kids had internet at home but no computers, so we put them on USB drives. Um, some kids had a device, and the device that they had was a, 
oftentimes it was not a smartphone, but it was a um, like an iPod, uh, um, iPod. And so kids brought that to class and we downloaded them directly to their iPods and that seemed to solve that for many of them. And then the other thing that we had is some kids who didn't have any to develop, but they, we, so we burned the videos onto DVDs and they put it in their Xbox or their DVD player and they were able to watch that. And so um, I was recently on a, a panel discussion, or actually I led the panel discussion and Keisha Ray was there. Uh, Keisha Ray is the president of ISTE, the International Society for Tech and Education. And uh, she shared this stat with me. She said 95% of all kids in the United States have access to internet at home. So um, this is becoming um, a less and less of an issue. And, um, you know, you don't make a policy based on 5% of your kids. You make an intervention for those 5%, don't you? So figure out a way to make this work, um, and you can make it happen. Um, and also another solution, of course, is that a lot of teachers aren't flipping in the class. They're doing it, or flipping outside of class. They're flipping in the class, what we call the in-flip. So I know a teacher, third grade teacher in Seattle, Randy Brown, by the way, his website is mrrbrown.org. I'll put that in the chat room. Randy, he uh, he uh, puts his class inside the class, so the kids half his kids watch a video on a particular topic, and while he works individually with the other half, and then he rotates throughout the course of the day. In his case, by the way, he's, he used to get 1.1 um, grades of improvement by his students pre pre flip, post flip it's 1.7. So um, you don't actually have to flip the class by having it as a home piece, although that is the typical way it's done. So kind of think through this. It's, it's really been quite quite thoughtful and powerful for us. So uh, any more questions? Do Becky you like the creative solutions? Any other quick questions? All right, so let's move on. So um, as we as we thought, again, some more uh, thoughts from Aaron and I is that is we don't think there's just one way to flip a class. We think there's more than one way to flip the class. So we have a, a bit of a chart here that I think will explain this. We call it the flip learning progression. So what Aaron and I call Flip Class 101, and we talk about this particularly in our second book, um, Flip Learning Gateway to Student Engagement, um, is that you know, a teacher assigns, say, a video on Tuesday night. And on Wednesday, they all come into class and they do the same activity, whatever that activity might be. And so we call that Flip Class 101. But what we find is that after about a year, teachers move beyond the flip classroom to deeper learning, which we call flip learning. So flip class is like the basic flip, if you will, and then they choose a different path. They might go to flipped mastery, flipped in peer instruction, flipped with project-based, genius hour, or the explore flip applied technique. We have a type of it. Um, so uh, some inquiry techniques. And so it seems like it's like a second iteration. Teachers start with the simple flip, and they move to deeper um, pedagogical methods. And these deeper pedagogical methods are deeply rooted in research, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, we particularly went to flipped mastery, where we found it to be a very, very powerful technique for students. It's a competency-based system where the students actually have to learn the content before they moved on. You know, um, and there's so much of a push um, across the United States, really, to do more mastery learning or you know, competency-based learning. And, and teachers really don't know how to do it, because the problem is, is if you're going to have a direct instruction, when do you deliver it? And you know, in mastery learning in particular, if you think about it, there's sort of a problem is that if you have to give direct instructions, when do you do it? But fast forward to the flipped classroom where the teachers can make short videos, or sometimes people call micro videos, that students can watch, and they can watch them when they need it. Not, not when the teacher is ready to deliver it on Tuesday afternoon during eighth period when she's going to just talk about, you know, about idioms or something like that. She's going to be able to, that content is now available 24-7 when the student needs the content. So mastery is, is, is the, we have a solution that um, kind of fell by the wayside, I would say, in the 70s and 80s when Benjamin Bloom um, was a big proponent of mastery learning. And the problem with, with logistics, I mean, he proved that learning was a very, or mastery learning was a very viable technique, but technology wasn't ready for it. And so I encourage you to think about um, flipped mastery. All right, so can you flip a school? Um, videos are hard on webinars, but I just want to, if you just do a search, I've got a kind of a link here to a YouTube video, and I know it doesn't work very well on this, but there's a whole school that's flipped. Um, it's Clinton High School in outskirts of Detroit. School of about 80% free and reduced lunch. 
before they flipped, their freshmen failed at about a 50% rate, and now they're failing at a much, much, much lower rate. You can watch this video. Um, I don't know if we could copy it and put in the link into the chat. Um, um, but if you if you search, you oh perfect, somebody Riley, thanks for finding that link, and or just typing that in. Then you can you might want to just watch that and just go wow, the school flipped and it just changed everything. The place is amazing. Some of you, if you're in Michigan, I encourage you to see if you can get a chance to go visit that school. And they're not the only school. Um, there was a recent article in the Boston Globe, and they highlighted Revere High School, which also has pretty much flipped, and, and the results that they're seeing. And also uh, an urban school with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, socioeconomic, um, low socioeconomics, and they're kind of 80% free and reduced lunch or something like that. And they're just seeing just remarkable results. And, and, and it crosses all spectrums. It's working in, you know, affluent communities and um, uh, communities with high free reduced lunch and everything in between. It's working at all levels, um, whether they're elementary schools or middle schools or high schools or universities. I know you saw the recent post, and uh, I don't know what the post was, but the Harvard Medical School is flipping. I mean, talk about, you know, that's interesting to think about it. So um, as we've thought about the flipped classroom, I think there's four T's. Um, the, the four hurdles, if you will, to flip the class, and we, we break them down into teams. So the first hurdle is actually what I've been spending some time on. You have to flip your thinking. You have to rethink what class time looks like. You see, the big question in flip learning is, is this. What's the best use of your face-to-face -face class time? And I'm going to argue that it's not a teacher standing up and yanking at their kids. It's something else. And But you have to rethink class time. What are you going to do with class time now that you flipped your class? You see, we had a teacher who came to us. This is how this question kind of came to us. She came to us after Aaron and I did a presentation in Canada, and, and she said, all right, I'm in. I want to flip my class. I said, cool. I said, and then she paused, and she said, but what will I do in class? And I said, um, I think you should answer that question. Because her implication, of course, is all she's ever done is lecture. So she doesn't know what she can even do in class. And so... We have to rethink what happens in class. We need to make class an active and an engaging place. That's the key. So this whole first segment, if you will, I've been trying to, if you will, convince you that flip learning is a good idea. So, and, and this is difficult. How do you get your teachers on board? How do you get them to flip their thinking? And um, how do you get, um, get that buy-in? Um, how do you get your staff to buy-in? Um, that's a big question. <laughs> You've got to convince them. If you've got teachers who are used to sort of doing this standard sort of chalk talk thing, how are you going to get your staff to buy in? I believe this is one of the most critical things. Um, I think they need an evangelist to use sort of a religious metaphor. You've got to somehow find that group of people. So let me, let me sort of describe your cadre. Or maybe I'll tell you this story. Um, Aaron and I are working with a school in Taiwan um, to help them flip their school. And they uh, brought to me the cadre of teachers who are going to be the first flippers. And I'm sitting there um, with, their, with their headmaster, it's a private school, sitting there with their headmaster. Um, and I turn to him and uh, I say, TC, we have a problem here. <laughs> and he said, what's the problem? I said, every person here in your initial cadre are a bunch of young people, young teachers. I need some people with white hair. And he said, well, wait, wait, wait. wait. But these are the ones who are good at technology. And I said, here's the person you've got to get on your initial cadre. You need somebody who is a seasoned teacher, got some white hair, probably been at your school for a long time, is probably a little bit afraid of technology, but also is a teacher who's really well respected by the staff. This is the, this is the guy, this is the gal they turn to. Um, you need to get that person on board. That is such an important person to get on board. Willing to learn, right? You're not somebody who's like, you know, digging their heels person. Is we've got to get that person on board because you know what the research says about staff buy-in on any initiative, regardless if it's flipped or any initiative you want? You know, will teachers, you know, I'll ask you this question. Who will they listen to to change their practice? Will they listen to you, principals? Research says no. <laughs> will they listen to you, uh, curriculum director? Research says no. Will they necessarily read a book and change? Research says no. You probably know the answer. What will change their practice when they see another teacher doing it? It's about teacher buy-in, getting other teachers. So you've got to get that initial cadre of teachers to start flipping. You know, I've done some work at a, a school in the Chicago area where I live now, Warren Township High School, a great school. 
And uh, when they first started flipping, they had five teachers. They're up to 75. But it, it was a course over years, and teachers saw the success that these other teachers were having with their kids at their school and their context. So it's so important to get that small group of teachers that can expand, that can expand, that can grow, and then you can flip the school. Do not start by saying, all right, well, I'm going to flip. It doesn't work. Um, I'm working with another school. That they said, oh, we're going to try to get everybody to flip. I spoke to all the groups, and now this year I'm spending time working with that 30 teachers who are ready to flip, and they're going to be the initial cadre. So we had to sort of take a step back because I thought, oh, we're going to try and get that buy-in. Um, so, and I, might, I would guess that you're also so, might be surprised, but I would bet at almost every school in the United States we've got teachers flipping. You may not know about it, but they're, they're doing this, and, you know, celebrate that. Um, this is this is growing significantly. So, how do you get staff buy-in? I don't know a lot of answers. Um, also, can you model it? So, I met a, a principal in uh, about a year ago, one year ago, I guess, Green Bay, Wisconsin teacher and, or principal, and he, uh, I, I said, you know what you got to do? You got to flip your faculty meetings. And that gum with this guy, we didn't back and go do exactly that, and he modeled it, and it's changed the whole culture of his school. So model it. Flip your meetings. All right. Again, what's the best use of your face-to-face -face time? It's not called class time for you. It's called a staff meeting. Flip your staff meetings. Um, if you want to read more, I wrote a blog post about. Actually, no. I did, uh, the, the the principal wrote a guest blog post on our blog. Um, I don't know, Con, if you're in there, if you could put that link into that. Um, also, I did a radio show on my radio show, and I interviewed this principal. And it's just a pretty fascinating story about what he was able to do and how he netted actually 24 more hours of professional development for his staff by flipping at staff meetings. So model it. Um, you got to get some parents to buy in, too. How are you going to get them? Um, you know, I gotta, I'm got i going to say something I know you're going to hear if you flip your, if your teacher starts flipping their class. Principals, you're going to hear. You're going to have a parent come to you and they're going to say, they're going to say, um, well, the students will go home and they're going to tell their parents this. They're going to say, my teacher's not teaching anymore. Okay? If your teacher's not teaching anymore, um, that's not true. I mean, they're teaching in a different way. So I would encourage you to think this through, is how are you going to respond to that and prepare for that conversation. By the way, Derek, I don't think that is, that's not the link from our one. The Connected Principles, that might be another interesting one, but um, that's not the one I did, but that's cool. There's more than one people doing this, so that's awesome. So get some parent buy-in. And then students, it's important to convince the students. You know, one of the most interesting things I recently did, I was in a school in Adelaide, um, South Australia, and uh, they were wanting to bring flip classroom to their school. And you know what they did? And this is one of the best things I've ever seen happen. Is that um, So we had a, I had an audience um, of staff members and also staff members from other schools in the area. And I want to say there was 250 staff in a big auditorium, and I did a one-hour presentation. But the other people they brought into the room were the 40 student leaders. So I was introduced by the students. They'd done some research on Flipped. And um, after I left, or after after it was over, I had a wonderful time to chat with their principal, and she says, bringing those students into this conversation was so huge, because the kids are basically saying, finally somebody teaches the way I learn. I mean, we're teaching the YouTube generation, so let's 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 leverage that. So um, I encourage you to figure out how to get students involved in this process, um, and they will be the change agents that you might be thinking. So the first, the first T in flipping uh, uh, is to flip the thinking. So you've got to flip the thinking of your staff, you yourself, uh, the principals, and also the students. The second T is training. It's important that you get appropriate training. So this is, this is the kind of thing that Aaron and I are essentially doing now across the world is we are um, conducting training sessions and also continuing to write some books on subjects. So it's important that... Uh, Teachers do this well and with fidelity. Um, sometimes we've seen teachers who've not done it with fidelity. Um, I just went through, and I, I, this, this is not something I'll talk about in this uh, session, but I talk about the 12 biggest mistakes people make when they first flip their class. And just, just a little bit ago, I'm here, you know, like I said, in Ulster County, New York, and um, we did this presentation. I shared the 12 biggest mistakes, and this teacher came up to me and said, what do I have to do if I'm doing eight of those 12 mistakes? Because he jumped in, what this teacher did, and, you know, bless his heart, he started flipping his class, but he hadn't really learned exactly how to properly do it, and so he was making a lot of mistakes. And so it's important to get the appropriate training. So I'd encourage you to, to, to check out our books or, you know, um, frankly, you can hire us to come do some work for you or whatever, but get some uh, training on how to flip well, because if you don't, um, because your teachers will make some of these same mistakes. So get appropriate training. A lot of resources. Um, um, this webinar is probably one of those things as well. 
So training is important. Um, we have a newsletter, and I think uh, you're all going to get subscribed to the newsletter. So if you go to bit dot ly slash flip newsletter, um, you can get a link to our newsletter that we send out every week. Um, we've also got some books, like I've been mentioning, Flip Your Classroom and Flip Learning. Um, those are our first two books. And what we're most pretty excited about right now is this new series of books where we've actually broken it down by content area. Flip for English, Flip for Elementary, Math, Science, Social Studies. The only book that's not available right now is the elementary book. We submitted this to our publisher um, last week. The other books are now in print. Literally, the English and the Social Studies books landed on our doorstep. Friday um, of last week. So these are brand new books, um, social studies and English. Math and science have been out for just a few months. So I encourage you to get a copy of these. They're real short books. I actually have them somewhere here with me. If I have time, I'll pull them out. They're just little tiny little books, um, very simple books. They basically address the question, now that you've made a video, um, what do you do with class time? Written directly to teachers. Uh, elementary folks, yours will come out, I think, January or February, according to my publisher. It's got some editing and things to do, you know, that whole process. Um, another place I'd turn you to is that we've created some, some docs to help you do some planning. So if you go to bit.ly slash flip planning docs, you can get some information. There's, for example, a rubric on how to um, make appropriate videos um, and um, like sample parent letters that you could send home, things of that nature. So this is like a, it's a, it's a Google doc. Um, we just ask that, you know, you can copy these things, but you can't sell them at all. You know, we have our logos on them. So yeah, I encourage you to go there. Some interesting places to get some training um, as well. And then also, um, a lot of people find a lot of, uh, have fun with my radio show. My radio show I have is uh, um, seven minutes, eight minutes long episodes where I talk about um, issues related to flip, and not always flip too. I also just talk about good educational practice from my my 28 years as an educator. And um, a lot of people found this um, very useful. I get 30,000 downloads a month on YouTube or on uh, iTunes, pardon me, and so it's it's uh, become quite popular, and I encourage you, they're just seven-minute segments, I encourage you, I get guests sometimes, sometimes not, so I encourage you to go to these places. So these are some places where you can get some good training, so you've got the books, training, we can also, if you go to our website at flippedclass.com, um, we've got some online courses, um, so uh, I encourage you to take one of our online courses, or one online course, um, and teachers can sign up for that. Um, there's a cost involved, but they can get college credit, you know, for salary advancement, et cetera. So I encourage you to check out our, our courses. Um, I don't think I have a slide on that, so that's important. Um, let me say one other thing in terms of training. I'll give you one piece of advice. Is, is a lot of people say, well, you know, should the teachers make their own videos, create, or should they use other people's videos on the Internet, curate? And frankly, um, I like to think of this as a spectrum um, of curate versus create, and best practices is that the teachers are the ones creating the content, not, not using internet resources. And some people think that that seems crazy, that John and Aaron and Flip team are saying that teachers should make the videos, even though like there's, you know, 20 videos, 120 videos on essentially how to add fractions with, you know, or whatever, some pick your topic. Um, but good teaching, as you know, principles is about relationships and connections with kids. And these are your these kids are your teachers' kids. And so I'd encourage um, best practice is the teachers are the ones creating the content. So this is um, I know this is a lot of extra work and it takes extra time. But um, whenever I've seen a poor implementation of flipped, it's because the teachers are not making their own videos. And when they are making their videos, I see um, positive results. So, and this has been borne out from K through college and the whole deal. Um, yeah, Peggy, excellent point. Um, students are also great peer teachers and help create the videos. Exactly. Um, that's one of the big findings in our series of books is just how many teachers are having kids create flip videos for class. Um, so the first T, if you will, was flip the thinking. The second one was get appropriate training. So I've been talking about good training with some links and such. The third one is time. Now this is the one that frustrates the teachers the most. They're busy especially as we implemented the new standards and whatnot. This is a big, big deal. How do we find time? So let me give you some suggestions. Um, first of all, PLC time. Um, there are schools that have figured this out um, by saying, I'm going to devote PLC time to helping teachers flip their classroom. So devote a significant amount of time to doing this. I walked into one school um, in Texas, and I saw one of the most amazing flipped examples uh, of a school that has gone just crazy down the road to middle school. And um, 
And then I kind of got under the hood and said, why has it been so crazy effective here? I mean, their test scores are just beyond amazing compared to they used to be. It's just a good story. Um, email me or something like that. I can give you the link to the school or you know contact the principal. But as I as I finally got under the hood and figured out why is it working so much here, I discovered that the, the principal, what he did is he set it up at this middle school that his teams of say sixth grade math teachers or you know eighth grade uh, English teachers or whatever, they had 42 minutes a day with each other, and they were spending that time flipping their class together. So as I didn't take in the airport, Steve is his name. I said, Steve, this is working because you gave your teachers the time. You figured out a creative way in your schedule to get teams of teachers working together to make this happen. And you made it a priority. You know, I've also walked into schools where they, the, you know, the school district and the principal and whatever it is, they have like eight initiatives. And teachers have initiative fatigue. They're tired. Um, and if you make flip a focus, can I say this strongly enough? I promise you, you're your results will dramatically change in your school. But you've got to make it a priority in initiatives, get appropriate training, get staff on board. I mean, there's a lot of steps to make this happen, but time is huge, huge, huge. Um, I know another teacher, or principal hired me, this is actually the one at Clintonville High School, he hired subs, so he had enough money to hire subs, um, and he'd say, you two math teachers, go make videos today, go. We're, we need, I, I need to get this thing going faster and faster. So I encourage you to flip uh, by, by, by finding, uh, paying for time, basically, right? Um, you know, I know that budgets are tight, but I know you have a budget. And so prioritize this, and you're going to see these huge results. Figure out a way to creatively get your teacher's time. You have the keys to the time. Other key creative things, I've seen uh, principals who, you know, um, taken some of the downtime that's in testing, so in state testing or whatever, in the park test or whatever test you're giving your students, sometimes um, you don't need every teacher to be proctoring the test and you can get some creative time for your teachers that way. Um, I know one school who won a grant and they actually just said, all right, I'm going to give you 20 bucks an hour for any extra time you put in related to this flip project and, you know, you can make an extra $2,000 in the year. So it wasn't a whole lot of time, a whole lot of money, but for teachers, it incentivized them and they're, they're flipped thing took off. So, uh, I don't know, how can I say this? Figure out a way to give your teachers time, uh, principles. Um, and realize also that there's a change process. One thing we talk about in our first book is our principal, Del Garrick is his name, great guy. Um, and he, he said, you know, to get any kind of change to happen, it's going to take three years. First year of a new initiative where it's flipped or whatever, but in that case we're talking flipped, of course, in the context is it's brand new and teachers are struggling with it. And um, the second, and see students, everybody is. The second year, you're working out the kinks, and the third year, it's culture. So, you know, be willing to just take some time for the change to happen. And I think of the principal um, in the Warren Township, now Scott High School near Chicago, where I live, and how they just let it sort of happen organically with the five teachers, but they really supported it with huge amounts of professional development and really created a culture in which the change could happen. So you can make this happen. It's just, you know, it takes leadership. And, you know, as you know, as a leader, leader matter, leadership matters. Um, and then the last um, hurdle to flipping your class, the first one was um, thinking. The second one was training. The third one was time. And the fourth one is technology. Um, there is a technological hurdle. Um, and um, for some teachers, this is a big, big hurdle to overcome. For some, it's, well, it's not so big. It depends on sort of their comfort level with tech, right? Because there is a technological hurdle. Not the, it's not the key to the flipped classroom, but it is important. And so um, on our website at flippedclass.com, I'll put it here, tools, um, we have a list of different tools that you can um, use. Um, we think there's four categories of tools as you flip your classroom, video creation tools. Um, and if you click on the link on our website, on that link I just posted, um, right here in the video creation, um, we list several creation tools, video hosting tools, so where you're going to put your videos, this is what you're going to need to make it. Video interaction tools, um, these are tools that allow you to like build in assessment questions into the videos, very powerful tools. And then a uh, learning management system. And each of these are hot links on our website, and so you can go there and look at some of these tools. And frankly, what I, let me just say this, is the one thing that when Aaron and I do a training for a school, we'll spend some time chatting with their IT staff and their administrative staff and trying to determine what's the best tools, because they're, there's no right tool. There's just lots of tools. And I, I, you can also give teachers too many choices. 
and it just confuses them. So I, I, I believe in saying, here's a few choices, pick this tool or that tool, maybe two tools, maybe three, or whatever, um, at least for the video creation tool. I think when you get to video interaction, I think maybe that's a school decision. And when you get to the um, uh, learning management system, I think that's just a central office decision. You guys just make the decision. Um, otherwise, it can be too confusing. So encourage you to um, think through this tech piece. Um, at, a, at a leadership level, get your IT staff on board, figure this out. Um, one thing I'll also say is if you haven't really, you know, sort of bought into wireless infrastructure in your school, it makes a huge difference if you've got, you know, a strong wireless infrastructure. And I know that's crazy expensive. I, you know, I um, you knew this, but I was a tech director uh, for a school district of Scripps of Chicago, my last sort of real job. And, um, you know, we, we brought a BYOD program to the K-8 school that I was director of tech at. And, you know, we had to increase our bandwidth tenfold. Um, it was expensive. It was a lot of work. Uh, and it was worth every cent we spent. So this is a big deal. I know this, I don't, but I know President Obama has been wanting to, uh, has, you know, trying to source some money at this, you know, through E-rates and different things. So um, this is becoming less of an issue, but, you know, some of you probably aren't in that, in that ball game. And then, so which of the tools, I'm often asked this question, which of the tools is the best tool um, to flip your classroom? And you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> I'm going to say it's the one you will use. How's that for um, being vague? Because, again, I think it depends on your IT infrastructure. Are you a Mac school? You're a PC school? Are you a more of an iPad school? I mean, do your kids block YouTube? You, I mean, there's so many answers. So, again, this is where I think the personal consultation makes a huge difference. I'm glad to chat with any of you uh, offline about this. Um, so, yeah, here's the website, flipclass.com slash tools, and you can see those things. Um, some other thoughts. I'm going to kind of quickly uh, bang through these. I want to leave some time for Q&A. Um, well, your first cadre, actually, I already talked about this. Your first cadre, get that old guy on there, right? That old gal who is that great teacher. Get that person on board. Do not just get young, tech-savvy teachers. That's a huge mistake. Get that cadre going. Note that class won't look like this. If you flip a class, you're going to notice that you're at Garfield? Oh, that's a Colorado school. Sorry. Heather, are you at Garfield in uh, in uh, Colorado? Oh, sorry, I love Colorado stuff. You are awesome. All right, sorry. Um, class won't look like this. You're going to walk in, and classes are going to look a little bit more disorganized. They're going to look more like um, I thought I had a picture there. But you, they're going to kids will be active and engaged in doing their learning. I know I know two teachers who lost their jobs because of the flipped classroom, and um, because the principal expected this picture that we have on the screen. Know the classroom will be noisier, busier, but more engaged, and kids will be actually learning. I promise. Okay? Um, the rooms will change because in a flipped learning, there's no need for the, the center of the room to be a chalkboard or an interactive whiteboard. The center of the room can be about learning. So know that you're going to change the way teachers structure their rooms, and that's okay. Be prepared for complaints. You're going to get some complaints. Like I said, some parents are going to come and say, well, our teacher's not teaching anymore. So be prepared for that. Um, some students are going to come and complain to you. Um, they're struggling with change. People struggle with change. You know that as a leader. You know, you bring in changes and you've got resistors. Just be prepared. It's going to happen. Um, I think one of the best roles our principal, Bell, gave to, he just encouraged us. He knew we were trying something new and we weren't sure it was going to work. And he just stood by and said, you know, I believe you in it as educators and I'm going to encourage you. You know, he helped us think through a lot of things, particularly some of the assessment stuff that we totally got wrong. Um, I encourage you to to encourage your teachers. I mean, again, this is just good leadership, but especially as they try something new in this whole flipped approach, you know, if, if they're you know they're going to make mistakes, uh, you know, they're going to make their videos too long, or they're going to you know you're going to hear some stuff, and you know, stand by them as they're as they're stepping out trying to do something new. Um, um, now, IT is an issue, and sometimes I've seen, I don't know if this is true in your district, but sometimes I've seen, I've seen, and I've worked with a lot of schools across the world, sometimes it feels like the IT department, and I used to be the IT department, so I can say this, the IT department gets a bit too um, protective of their network and these kinds of things, but they forget that um, you, the principal, are the boss of the IT department. And so <laughs> if you say we want to make this work, then you can make it work. Sometimes, you know, can I say this nicely, sometimes IT people can be a bit of a control freak. And uh, they're afraid of anything hurting their network. And that's, I get it, all right? But we need to do what's best for kids. So if you think this needs to happen and you want to unblock this, then you need to just say, make it happen. They can do this. Trust me. 
All right, I know they can. I did it. Um, I think it's important to rethink hiring, okay? Who are you going to hire for teaching? Um, a recent study we have is that 40% uh, of administrators are just bring flip learning to um, the classrooms. Um, rethink how you're hiring. Hire teachers who are ready for collaboration and change, not just ones who are content experts. Again, I want content experts. But, and, I, and I know this is, may not be the easiest thing because there's shortage of teachers in certain parts of the United States. And so maybe you don't have as big of a choice, but do I try and find those people who are ready to do change? You know, hire some leaders um, who can help bring flip to your classroom. You know, um, this is becoming a huge part of, of teacher ed programs. Um, so find teachers. Some teachers, I know, I, I interviewed on my radio show one town gal. She's never not flipped. She started teaching her very first year and she flipped. So she's just a brand new teacher. So all right, I'm going to do this. Find those people. Be a buffer. I guess this comes back to you're going to have some complaints. Be a buffer for your teachers because they're going to, you know, as they're trying something new, there's going to be issues. So, like, protect the quarterback. That's the analogy, right? Um, listen. Be a sounding board. Like, I can tell you, Dell, our principal, he was a sounding board for our, our questions. Uh, um, you know, kind of just jump in. Again, you probably already are this, but especially as they're trying these new in initiatives out. And as I close, um, why is flip learning working? I was actually challenged by this when I was in China just last week, I guess it was, and I was sitting with uh, uh, Professor Bahani Zhang, I probably butchered your name, Dr. Zhang, if you're on line. Uh, but Dr. Zhang and I were having this interesting conversation about why flip learning works. And he says, you know, John, we've got enough research that says that it does work. You know, he was thinking more, you know, from a testing perspective and whatnot. And he says, but what I'm interested in is why. You know, if you, know, if you are a car guy and you find a car that's really fast, right, you, you know, race car, um, the question you want to know is, well, why is it fast? So that open up, you have to open up the hood, right? And you open up the hood and you say, well, this fuel injector here, this... You know, this turbo there, this, you know, bigger cylinder, there, whatever. You can figure out why a car is fast. And so he challenged me, and he said, John, why does flip learning work? Why is it so successful? And as we sat there and talked, I'll give you a couple answers. I'd say number one is that we, there is very, very strong research that says the more background knowledge somebody has, the better they're going to learn something. And, of course, flip learning, these flip videos that students are watch, watching, of course, are a way of pre-learning. And so it's giving a student some background knowledge before they walk in the door. So that's one thing. But I also think flip learning is really about relationships. It's about the connections you can make with kids because you've got more time to make them, both cognitively but also affectively. So I think it enhances that teacher-student conversation, that relationship. And, you know, the subtitle of our first book, in fact, really alludes to this. We said reach every student in every class every day. I said we'll talk to every kid in class, every class every day. So I encourage you to... I think the relationship piece is, is key. And then we talk about some other reasons. So um, I guess maybe the point of this is to say, yes, it works. And there's a lot of reasons why. It almost feels like it's the perfect storm for learning. And um, my wife used this analogy the day we were talking about this. She says, as if you know, every kid's a seed, and, but they're different seeds. You know, one's a tomato seed and one's a um, raspberry seed and, you know, one's an asparagus seed or whatever. And they need different conditions to thrive. And flipped is, is creating, if you will, different types of soil for each kid and different amounts of light and different amounts of water because every seed needs something a little bit different. So it allows you to personalize the learning for each kid. It's this differentiation piece that flipped lends itself to because, of course, you're not standing up and delivering content to the same group of kids all at the same time you can individualize it for each kid. And I think that's one of the big reasons why it's really working. And then I'll kind of sort of really wrap up with this thought. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say this to teachers, and I think, well, the administrators to some degree. So, so I'll say this to teachers. I know some of you most of your administrators, but if you can be replaced by YouTube video teachers, now hear me carefully when I say this, because I'm going to say something somewhat um, acerbic. Um, if you can be replaced by a YouTube video, you should be. You see, if it, all a teacher is doing is disseminating information and content, then, they're, then they can be replaced by a YouTube video. We as teachers need to be helping our kids with the higher order of cognitive test, thanks to Bloom's taxonomy from a bit ago. That's the key to, to, I think, all of education, let alone the flip. And so I'm not saying we want to replace teachers. Frankly, I think we need more teachers, and I think our classes are too big. And, um, 
because teaching is fundamentally about human interaction. And the duty of flip is you're going to have more human interaction. So I encourage you to, to think about that. If you can be placed by a YouTube video, you should be, but let's rethink what education is so that we can give more value to our students. So um, with that, I would like to just open it up to some q and A. I bet there's some q and A. I don't know how many people are in the room. 30 it looks like. So what kind of questions do you have for John? Throw it in the chat. Yeah, feel free, uh, everyone, if you have questions for John, uh, Please uh, put them in the chat, or uh, you know, don't hesitate to turn on your microphone and uh, and uh, chime in. Oh yeah. Looks like people are leaving. Oh, there we go. Can you share a success for a country of flip staff meeting and how they did it? Yeah, so this Paul Hermes from Green Bay, I mentioned him earlier. If you go to that, uh, there was a link earlier. Someone posted it. Um, um, he just created little videos about instructional stuff or the stuff that, you know, the information that you got to give it to teachers. So, you know, here's the stuff about homecoming dance and I don't know, whatever, all that kind of stuff. And then what he did is he re-envisioned that staff meeting time and, and actually used that for like a lot of sort of practice PD stuff. So they might like watch a quick TED video and then boom. I want you guys to, you know, one group would work on say, you know, technology stuff. I think he was moving to like Google Apps or something like that. It was some kind of a big tech initiative that year. And he was able to get, like he said, 24 hours back uh, for teachers to get staff sort of development time because he used that staff meeting time for that by simply making a flipped lesson. Now, one thing he did, you say, wait a second, what if parent, uh, the teachers don't watch the video? He actually set it up so that there's ways there's software, you know, time to talk about this, there's software that tracks you. And so he was tracking his teachers to see if they actually did it, right? And if they didn't, he called them out. And he said, I only had to do that once. He had a couple of computers in the back of the staff meeting and said, all right, these three teachers haven't watched it, so go, do, they, they learn quick, you know. Um, so anyways. So I encourage you to go to that, that uh, link on, I don't know where it was earlier, and listen to the, uh, the, the uh, interview, too. I think that's pretty fascinating. Here it is. So we flipped our faculty meetings here. I'll throw that back in the new chat down here. Somebody put it in. So I encourage you to go there. He's got some great stuff. So A lot of, te a lot of principals are doing this. There's also an article I wrote with uh, ASCB and Leadership, that third kind of leadership magazine, where um, there was a principal on the East Coast who did it too, and so I, I could have to find that link somewhere about Flip's faculty meetings. It was on Ed, Ed Leadership uh, Magazine. Any more questions? Thanks for the I question, I have a Peggy. question. Um, how, how, how would you advise a, a district that's, you know, looking into how to integrate technology, but they're kind of hesitant to make any major changes because like your test scores and all academic indicators are very, very high. They don't want to break something that, you know, doesn't need fixed, but they realize, you know, the future of learning is, you know, blended and flipped. Well, I would argue that um, they think they're doing a good job, and maybe they are. I don't want to overstate that, but um, they, they can always do better. And, um, I mean, uh, yeah, I the world has changed, and I think we just need to sort of wake up to that reality. And, I mean, when I share with teachers, as I do on an almost, you know, weekly basis, I'm on a plane somewhere, and I'm I'm chatting with teachers, and they get it from in those communities where schools have been successful. Um, folks, this is working. Maybe, this, maybe think of it this way. You know, so many schools for many years have been fighting kids and technology use, and I think instead of fighting it, um, folks, we need to infiltrate it. So let's infiltrate the, the tech culture instead of fight it. Um, so let's use um, the technology that's already in those kids' pockets um, for positive learning outcomes. You know, and, and you know, are are you willing to do some investment? You know, I mean, I talk about learning management. You know, and the technology stuff. I mean, Blackboard is one of the, you know, I don't know if it's a leader, but certainly one of the biggest leaders and the best programs out there for learning management. And um, you know, those are some big initiatives, but. I think the mistake that we've had actually with learning management system, here I'm saying this on a Blackboard webinar, is that, you know, very few teachers actually use the learning management systems. 
um, well and effectively, and, and they're a huge investment. But if we don't have a reason why they should use it, then why do they? So when Aaron and I first, you know, you know, concocted the flipped idea, um, we needed a learning management system, um, but we didn't really need it until we had the flipped method where we had a place to put all that stuff. So this gives reasons to use these learning management systems like Blackboard um, and, you know, because it is a huge expense. And, and I, I know, you know, schools don't mind spending a lot of money if the product you buy is going to get used. But if it doesn't get used, then uh, that's just a waste of money. And so, um, so if you're doing this big initiative with, don't do a tech initiative. Uh, can I say that? Don't do a tech initiative. Do a pedagogical initiative that has tech involved. You know, they say, hey, we're going to buy iPads for every kid. Well, so what? What are you going to do? That's the bigger question. You know, start with good pedagogy, then add the technology. Don't do the reverse. That's what we've done too much. And in fact, that's something that's keeping everybody in business. These schools, they buy all these iPads, and then they, and they say, help, we don't know what to do with them, you know, or Chromebooks or pick your device, because the teachers don't know how to re-envision what happens in the classroom. So, yeah. All right, we've got five more minutes. Any, any one last question, or just a wrap-up questions, Riley and Katie, or wrap-up slides? I don't know what's the... No, I was just, we I was just going to add, John, that, that I totally agree with that. It, it's not about using technology for technology's sake. The purpose of our solutions at Blackboard is to improve teaching and learning, to improve student achievement. And so the goal has to be to impact student achievement, and, and the technology you know, is a means to that goal. Mm -hmm. yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Well, I want to just thank everybody for uh, sticking with it. I know somebody dropped off at the end, but uh, I know this will be available later on YouTube, so I hope that that will be useful for people. Um, I encourage you to you know go to our website, flipclass.com, and and if you want to learn more about what we're doing, um, we've got, of course, books. You can go to our store on there and look at the books we sell. Um, we've got, oh, there are six books right now, the seventh one coming out in June or January. Um, encourage you to do that. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, having me be part of this. Thanks for Blackboard for them uh, hosting this. Um, it's uh, great to have them as a, as a partner. Well, and a big thank you, uh, John, uh, for uh, taking the time out of your day. Uh, we know you have a busy schedule, and we appreciate you uh, uh, being a part of our uh, innovative teaching series. Um, so, uh, yeah, just uh, appreciate it. And uh, if anybody does have uh, any questions that you didn't get a, a chance to ask, sure. um, you know, feel free to reach out to us, uh, you know, either on Twitter or or. Uh, via email or through our uh, Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series professional learning community. Uh, and, and we're happy to connect you either with a, a Blackboard expert or, uh, you know, forward on questions to, to John and, and, and Aaron as well. Riley, before we sign off, there's one more question in there from Peggy, John. Um, what's your advice for creating the video? Should you do it once and consider it okay, or should you keep trying for perfect? Um, my recommendation is, is is do it once and be okay with not being perfect because it's just too much work. I mean, if you want to go back, if, you know, and tweak it and whatnot, teachers, it just takes too long to make something perfect. And then, so, you know, I guess with this statement, do you need it perfect or do you need it Tuesday? The answer is Tuesday. So, yeah. Well, great. They like your answer. All right. Thanks, Riley. Thanks, Katie. And uh, I, I did see a question in the chat asking uh, if this would be available offline um, later today. Uh, today, uh, you know, early tomorrow, we're going to have this recording available on YouTube, and uh, you know, from there, we'll, we will also make it available in the uh, Blackboard Innovative Teaching Series professional learning community. Uh, so feel free uh, to, to check either of those places out. Uh, and uh, you know, for attending today you will get a follow-up email uh, with links to those resources. So big thanks again, uh, John, for joining us today. And uh, we, we really appreciate it. And we look forward to uh, you know, working together again right, sometime great. soon. Thank you.